All right. Well, welcome everyone. This is Thaddeus Gord, Director of Extension for Adams County, and I'm the agriculture agent, but I also love greenhouses. And I'll tell you a little background of my greenhouse experience. I started at age 12 or 13 and built my first greenhouse, which was a lean-to. I used uh, two by twos, connected it against the house, used a very cheap plastic, and uh, started with that and uh, learned a lot really quickly. When you do your first greenhouse, you're gonna find out that uh, initially you tried to do it as cheap as possible, but you realize that uh, you've probably cut corners that you shouldn't have, and you'll find out why due to uh, environmental conditions that you want to be able to control in your greenhouse. And if you don't do it properly, you can't, and things get rather hot or rather cold, depending on uh, the temperature outside. So uh, that was my first greenhouse. There I uh, upgraded and went into uh, mortar and brick and uh, built my second one. And that one was in high school. And I turned that into a hydroponic greenhouse. And that worked out pretty well. I had tomatoes in the winter. It was pretty good. But I learned a lot about pests and allowing people to put plants in your greenhouse. And we'll talk about that. Um, from there, I decided to uh, go to college. And so, of course, I had the uh, luxury of working at a university that had nice greenhouse systems and I did a lot of my research in greenhouses. Um, also, when I got out of school, I put a nice greenhouse together when I moved to Fort Collins and that was one of my first ones where it was totally automated. I really got spoiled and I enjoyed that immensely and I'll talk a little bit about that one. And from there, I moved to Denver and of course, after many years of uh, contemplating wanting a greenhouse, I put my greenhouse in Denver. That's what I've got today. And you'll see it today and, uh, and then also the construction of that greenhouse. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. So the first question I want to do is, um, and this is for you all, if I can get, Cassie, can you uh, run the poll on that? Thank you. Gotcha. So have you ever thought of buying or building a greenhouse? And if you'd go ahead and answer your question, be honest on uh, what your thoughts are on that, but if you could. All right, you got anybody else out there? Okay, one more person to break the tie, I think. <laughs> Come on, there we go. Yay. All right. All right. So yes, and maybe. Perfect. Okay. So um, let me go ahead and share the results so far. There we go. Okay. So there you go. So two of you, yes, one, maybe. Okay. Let's go ahead and knock that down. There we go. go have to double click on that. There we go. So you want a greenhouse. So my first question to you all is how deep are your pockets? Uh, one thing about greenhouses, it can almost be the sky is the limit when you're looking at building one. Uh, it's very similar to remodeling a kitchen uh, or a house. Uh, you find out that you have a budget and then you find out really quickly that you'll probably exceed that budget. And it just happens because usually when you're uh, working with something that's new to you, um, you find out that uh, what you thought you wanted, you probably want to upgrade, and so the costs do escalate from that. So uh, plan, uh, planning is smart. So what do you want? Do you want a year-round greenhouse, or do you want like a season extender greenhouse? A smaller version of a cold frame, perhaps? Maybe a sun space? an addition to the house, which is nice. And you can have plants in that too. That works very well if you, uh, if you design it correctly. And then there's also window greenhouses. And again, usually I see those put on where there's a sink in the kitchen. They usually pull one out uh, of that. Uh, and you'll find the uh, limitations of that really quick. And then also indoor light, light gardens. And the beauty of course now is with all of the uh, high-tech LED light systems, you don't need outdoor light in order to be successful. There's a lot of LED systems that do very well indoors in a basement or in an attic. So a greenhouse does not have to be expensive. However, you should provide the proper environment for your growing plants. And that's where it starts getting expensive. So what do plants need? Well, the first thing is light. Uh, plants need to grow 
uh, and they have to have light to do it. We're not growing mushrooms, right? Uh, and also we have to think about photosynthesis and the efficiency of photosynthesis. And that can be affected by your design and the type of uh, uh, coverings that you use. Temperature controls most everything in the plant. So the rate of water uptake, the rate of nutrient uptake, photosynthesis and cell division. So when you think about temperature, you wanna make sure that you put the correct plants in for the environment that you have built in that greenhouse. So if you're growing orchids, for example, you probably don't need intense light in order for it to work for, for orchids. However, if you're putting tomato plants and orchids, you got a problem because you got one that really loves the sun, the uh, direct sunlight, and you have another one that doesn't. So you'll have to either cordon off parts of your greenhouse so that you can do that and you can do it but that again is another expense but what you probably want to look at is aim for the sweet spot center to where you get enough sunlight to grow some of the things you really like and then the others where you could maybe put them in corners and, and have indirect light you can uh, make that happen in your greenhouse depending on the size of the greenhouse but again uh, a lot of the uh, uh, environmental control factors that you'll have to think about and that includes ventilation and such. So that's kind of temperature is important and we don't think about temperature in the summer other than how to cool it but in the winter when we get a 10 below temperature you got to make sure that your your greenhouse is uh, totally uh, good with that because you think about all those plants that you're probably going to put in your greenhouse some of them could be tropical and there's nothing worse to have your temperature module fail and uh, you freeze out everything in the greenhouse. And of course, that would be probably over Christmas when you're away uh, entertaining or, or visiting somebody. And so that's something to think about, that sometimes backup systems are not a bad idea either. Temperature of the air. Many hobby greenhouses have inadequate or missing heating and ventilation cooling systems. Um, and part of it is with greenhouses, the bigger you go, the easier it is to modulate the temperature. Smaller greenhouses are a lot harder to uh, correct temperature and balances. You can do it, but it requires uh, careful thought and systems to make that happen. But generally speaking, it's all about volume. The more volume you've got, you have uh, plus or minus, you, you've got a little flexibility in your temperatures. When you're going with a small greenhouse, uh, that's where it's very critical and uh, you can have cold spots in the greenhouse and warm spots and you'll find it really quickly. Your plants will tell you when you have issues like that. So yes, um, ventilation is expensive, but it makes a difference between success and failure. You know, just putting PVC together, making a frame and throwing plastic on top, you're going to find out in three days uh, the problem with something like that when you haven't thought about exhaust fans, intake shutters, um, things like that, and our, also circulation fans in the greenhouse. Temperature of the soil, more critical than air temperature, however, um, very closely related to the temperature of the air. So we want roots uh, grow slower at temperatures below 45 degrees, and a lot of them can't take up water and nutrients at a peak efficiency. So the best soil temperature generally is about 65 degrees. That works out really well. And of course, tomatoes love that. So we're really thinking about tomatoes at the moment. Um, so what do plants need? Well, water. Number one area that mistakes are made. Everybody thinks they know how much to water. But we know overwatering is extremely common. And go to any office and you can see it. And you can see those overwatered plants. They got the tips burned back on the, the edges of the leaves. Um, it's not a pretty sight. Underwatering, that usually happens when, of course, people go on vacation. Around Christmas time is when it usually happens. If somebody takes off two weeks, they come back and their plants might make it, but a lot of times they could be goners. Soil, uh, also called growing media. Uh, the temperature of starting seedlings or seeds, soil temperature must be around 70 degrees. And using bottom heat is important. I really like those grow mats. They're worth it. Um, I've fought for years not using them. And once you use one, you, it's hard to go back. Uh, so it works very well. And you get peak germination very quickly. 
especially if you're looking at the early spring when you want to start putting in your uh, seeds for your bedding plants and things like that. Um, and there's nothing worse than waiting two weeks for things to pop up. With uh, heat mats, five days, you're just going to start seeing results, some even quicker than that. Uh, the type of media should serve the following functions. Okay, it's got to provide water as a source of water for the plant, right? It's got to be able to mine water out of that out of that media. Also, it needs to supply nutrients, although that's not important because you could use just a, a typical per, uh, perlite, which is just puffed uh, pumice. And what it does is it holds the nutrients uh, for there, and you can add those. And because I'm into hydroponic gardening, um, I can add anything I need. And I apologize for this uh, phone. Hold on just a minute. So oh, sorry. I think my warranty on my 30-year-old uh, car just expired. So that's why they're calling me. Anyway, so nutrients, you can supply those. That's not a problem. Uh, uh, permit gas exchange to and from the roots. That's really important. Uh, that's why, generally speaking, we don't use a clay soil in a greenhouse because clay, of course, although it allows a lot of water availability, what it lacks is oxygen to those roots. So you want a, a media that allows gas exchange to so get oxygen in, CO2 out, and vice versa. So that's, uh, that's one of those things that is very important. Plus the weight. When you start bringing soil into a greenhouse, you're gonna find it really quick, those pots get really heavy versus the, what we consider media or artificial media. It is uh, much easier to deal with plants in pots in a greenhouse with that. And it also has got to provide support for the plants. And that's important so they stand upright. And of course, the example like perlite and vermiculite, if you've ever used that, um, the plants tend to fall over until they get really rooted into that system, then they can stand up. But early on, they're somewhat of a pain when you're putting them into a straight perlite mixture. Other factors, ventilation. This is one of those that, you know, ventilation is really important. So that V word, Think about that, okay, when you're designing your greenhouse. Air movement is necessary for cooling and other things too. Um, it's a common problem in greenhouses, overwintering or overheating in the summer. And for example, right now, I've basically shut down my greenhouse other than I have one plant in there. Um, I've got the vents open, but I'm not doing a lot of active uh, uh, ventilation at the moment. It does very well since a bird of paradise is what it is. Um, it doesn't mind a lot of heat. It does really well, but that's the only plant in there right now. And part of the reason is it's so big, uh, it weighs over 100 pounds, and I don't want to move it in and out of the greenhouse during the summertime. So I just let it stay in there, and it tends to flower every year. It does well, but at times it, uh, it's rather hot. One good thing that I have going for me with my greenhouse design is I have a deciduous tree in my backyard that does provide shade in the summer. So that really helps that greenhouse from just over, overheating, especially if you had a direct southern exposure. That's where you'd get 130 plus temperatures in that greenhouse easily, and not many plants can handle that. Relative humidity, this is a huge reason why you need ventilation. Relative humidity that's too high will lead to disease. Uh, there, it's not a question of, uh, of uh, will it happen, it will. Um, and how bad it is, that depends. But uh, usually speaking, high humidity is basically a precursor to disease. So you wanna be real careful in that. And of course, too low of humidity, you can have spider mite infestations and they do come in through the, the uh, air intakes and that's where possibly screening is not a bad idea. Um, different types of ventilation, you can have the, the gas shocks. Uh, Bayless makes a really nice uh, vent opener. And they're about $70, and that's the one shown in the bottom of the screen. Then, of course, if you really want to go high tech, you've got timers and temperature modules for the fans that kick on and off along with the intake, uh, outtake uh, fan uh, or 
events that open and close automatically. So remember the words from a realtor when you're selling a house, it's location, location, location. So when you think about when you're gonna place your greenhouse, your first choice, um, south or southeast side of the building, or if a shade tree uh, receives sunlight all day, generally. Uh, second choice is east side. It captures most of that sun, especially in November through February. That's when the, the darkest days of, of your uh, greenhouse are. And so having that early morning sun is important. When you think about the west side, um, the problem with the west is usually clouds are usually a problem. And so you lose a lot of sunlight that you may want to try to harvest in your greenhouse because of that. The, usually speaking, in the afternoon, the clouds do build up, and so you lose a lot of that western exposure. So that third choice, southwest or west of major structures, plants receive sunlight later in the day. And then fourth choice, north of major structures, only suitable for plants requiring low light levels. An example of that would be orchids or some other shade-loving plants. And you've got to think about the site selection in summer versus winter. And you're gonna find out really quick, the neighbor's yard or the neighbor's house has a dramatic effect on your winter sunlight that you will get. You don't think about that in the summer because the sun's almost directly overhead, but in the winter, it's down, or it's down on the horizon and any structure or plant can really reduce the amount of light you'll get in that greenhouse. So if this is a problem, especially in the city, that's where I am. Um, I have that issue with not only trees, but buildings, the neighbor's uh, garage throws a lot of uh, uh, light issues with me. But uh, the great thing about it is we now have some LED light systems that can fix that. So that's important. But, but do check the, the, uh, the winter solstice. Go ahead and check that because that's what you need to do is to find out what's the, that's the least amount of light you'll get during any time of year. So that's good to see where that shadow plane shows for the winter. And then of course, summer, you're gonna find out really quick that, wow, I have a lot of sunlight. I might even have to shade my greenhouse. So let's look at the types of greenhouses and other structures. So greenhouses uh, that we have the ones that are attached uh, to the, to the struct, to a structure, they're called lean-tos. Uh, we also have freestanding. Those are the greenhouses set out in the middle of the yard all by themselves. We have pit or underground greenhouses. We also have some window design greenhouses that can work. Um, then other structures, coal frames, shade houses, high tunnels, uh, row covers. One thing with a greenhouse you're gonna find, if you grow your own plants, you're gonna have to harden them off by bringing them out of the greenhouse and put them outside during the uh, and again, early spring when there's still frost, but if you can have some kind of shade effect where you can actually kind of uh, acclimatize those plants to direct sunlight. So it's not a bad idea to harden them off in a kind of a shady area initially out of the greenhouse, but yet still getting some sunlight and then slowly building them up so you have a plant that immediately will not suffer any shock when you transfer it into the soil in the spring. So lean to greenhouses. The advantages, most common, generally speaking, least expensive, and think about it, you only have one less wall that you have to worry about, right? So there's some expense there. Easy access, generally, if you have it attached to a building where there is a door, that makes it nice. Although I would not only have an, a door into the house or to the structure that you build it on, like the garage or barn, but also outside too, you need a door because bringing stuff in, and I was gonna say, bringing soil, bringing in pots, bringing in fertilizers, um, bringing in water, um, you need to have access from the out to the outside. Plus bringing plants out rather than running them through your house isn't necessarily the most ideal thing, especially in the spring. When you're bringing all your bedding plants out. And you're probably gonna create a, a little uh, trail of uh, media through your house if you do it that way. Uh, insulation for uh, uh, the house or garage. Uh, um, so it does help if you have an insulated side on that. It works pretty well. Extending the living space. 
Uh, so that's where almost the greenhouse becomes a uh, sunroom in a sense. And I did that in Fort Collins and my kids loved it. They grew up in that greenhouse in the middle of winter. They're out there. I had pea gravel for the floor and they loved it for their toys. They're out there playing in it all the time. In the, summer, in the winter time when it was really cold outside, of course that greenhouse uh, was all automated. So the temperature never varied a whole lot. I, I did enjoy that greenhouse. Disadvantages, size limitation. Again, the size of your structure depends on what you're uh, attaching it to. Uh, moisture, you got to be careful because in a greenhouse, higher humidity, you could actually cause some issues on the building that it's attached to. So you want to be real careful of that. And that's where proper ventilation is important to deal with that. Then summer overheating, again, uh, nobody knows what to do with all that extra heat in the summertime unless you're heating hot water for a lot of long showers. But generally speaking, uh, the hot water isn't the, the main attraction in the summertime. And so for that reason, you've got a greenhouse that's creating a lot of energy and you really can't do a lot with it. You can't store it. And then also dirt, insects, diseases, just general um, clutter. You can... Uh, really quickly fill a greenhouse with clutter. And of course, if it's attached to the house, uh, it, the, that tends to fall into the house itself. So it'll follow you right into the house. So here's examples of some lean-to greenhouses and uh, two models, uh, that they're, they're very nice. Um, I like the one on the right. Um, that one's called Sun Glow. And that was the one greenhouse I had in Fort Collins. I really liked it. It was a double plastic system. So it had some insulative properties associated with it. It had the corrugated uh, uh, plastic on the inside and the outside it had a clear flat piece. So it, was, it basically captured a little air wall in there and that did help uh, modulate the temperature. So it had a little bit better insulative properties than your straight glass or straight um, polycarbide. And there's a lean to and this is mine. Um, you can see that I attached it to the um, garage in this case. And the angle that I was able to use was dictated by my, um, the plane of the garage roof. And unfortunately, I couldn't follow the same plane of the roof because uh, it would be too short really quickly. Uh, so this did limit my angle of attack. I tend to like a little more uh, slope on my roof, for, especially for snow, but this worked out really well. And of course I over -engineered, engineered it to allow for that snow because it's not as steep, especially for winter climates like Colorado. Freestanding, uh, advantages, more flexible uh, location. You can put it usually anywhere where it's more suitable for a maximum light. That's important, so you can do that. Uh, easy to expand, a lot of these freestanding greenhouses you can uh, make attachments to, and you can expand them um, basically looking from the door, uh, going back that way. You can expand it that way. The other way, not so easy, but the great thing is they do have additions you can do. Um, so as you get more and more into your greenhouse, you can increase it. Uh, again, yeah, there's never, uh, enough space in a greenhouse. It just seems like it's like gas, you fill the container that you're in and the greenhouse will get very packed really quickly. So I always think if you can get a little bit bigger, that's not a bad thing. If in fact you decide to have a greenhouse. It's also a private getaway. When you think about it, if you have to walk out of the house in the middle of winter and go into, a into another building, most people won't follow you. So it is kind of a private getaway. I call it mental therapy. It works really well. Um, in, in my case, I, the greenhouse is my sanctuary. Uh, disadvantages, access. Again, the winter, you know, if you've got uh, it out in the yard and there's some, uh, some blowing snow and that, you're probably going to have to shovel the, the, uh, the door so you can open it up. So access could be an issue. Also, utilities. If you're running it from the house, you're going to have to bury your utilities in most cases. Hanging an uh, extension cord out to your greenhouse to heat it is not necessarily a great idea. You'll find out really quickly that uh, you'll want to have everything hardwired in when you look at utilities. And also the energy. Because you're not getting that wind block, for example, on a lean-to, you, you, you 
have the advantage of a building that actually is giving you some protection from the elements. Um, with a freestanding, they take the full brunt of uh, the cold or the hot, depending on what time of year it is. So here's some freestanding ones and there's some beautiful ones. The ones with glass just tend to uh, be the, the prettiest in my view, but uh, polycarbide uh, carbide is pretty good too. Um, I do like the stone glass idea. That one's, uh, I like that a lot. The one that's kind of the Quonset hut type thing or Gothic uh, up in the right co top corner. Um, that one works pretty well. It, they, they tend to be cheaper because of that design. However, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. If I had my druthers, I, I kind of like greenhouses that have sharp angles. Um, framing materials and the covering, the glazing. So frame, you got to support the cover. So you've got to think right now on what kind of covering you're going to have because that determines the size of the frame. Equipment, just remember, you're going to sometimes hang things on some of the struts. So you need to make sure that you calculate that in. And I was thinking of hanging plants, hanging baskets that you're going to be, you know, possibly uh, suspending from the ceiling. And you want to make sure that you don't max out the weight of that structure roof because you got to think about the addition of snow load. So must withstand our snow load. And again, you know, we have three feet of snow at times, not often. But if you do, you probably want to gear it toward that weight level to make sure that a, a greenhouse can withstand it. Mind you, if it's warm enough, uh, you will get melt off rather quickly. But uh, with some of our um, weather events, three feet of snow is not uncommon. And uh, you're either going to be out there with a broom to knock off some of the snow or have the temperature in a greenhouse high enough where you can melt it off. And that could be expensive. Uh, materials. Steel galvanized is usually uh, uh, a better deal because you have less rust issues. Of course, uh, if you had stainless steel, that would be the best. But uh, again, how deep are your pockets? Aluminum works really well. It's lighter. It's pretty strong. Um, it, but again, you, it's hard to weld. Uh, there's a few things about aluminum that it, it can be brittle at times. It doesn't have near the uh, structural uh, component of steel, but it is nice because it doesn't rust. Wood is easiest for your do-it-yourselfers. Then, of course, PVC pipe is a possibility, but my, my friends, I would say, don't do it. PVC pipe, you will not be happy over time. I, and again, within a year, you will not be happy with that investment. Um, I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, plus, it does age badly. Over time, you can get some uh, photo-stable PVC pipe, but uh, again, it's it's not that great when you really think about it. It would limit your uh, ability to do a lot of things. And structurally, it's not that strong. Uh, covering or glazing, so the more light you let through the covering, the better for plant growth. So for every 1% reduction in light that a plant receives, there will be a 1% percent reduction in plant growth. That makes sense, right? That if you put it in a closet, it's not going to grow because there's no light. So it's uh, based on that. So the types of greenhouse covering, there's glass, rigid plastic, there's fiberglass, reinforced plastic, and then the polycarbonate, there's single and double, and then of course your plastic films. Greenhouse environment, heating, cooling, ventilation, air circulation, they're all based on one thing. Hot air rises, cold air sinks. So you got to think about in a greenhouse, that's how you can get a cold spot in a greenhouse, especially under your, uh, your uh, benches and in the, on the north corner. You could definitely have an issue in that area. And of course, that's where that big plant that, you know, you take out in the summer and put in the greenhouse in the winter, and it may, you know, catch a cold in the winter in your greenhouse because of the cold spots possibly in that greenhouse. And that's where designing a good ventilation system, even in the winter, that you can uh, mix air in the greenhouse. That's what you want. And I'll show you a few tricks on that. Heating. Uh, heating requirements depend on uh, the crop grown location of, uh, you know, by the way, let me, I'm like Ted Lopez, let's see, I think, is he coming in? I want to get rid of that. Okay. Uh, air 
movement through vents. Let me go back. Hold on. Let's see. Let's get back. Okay. So, uh, heating requirements depend on the crop grown, location of the greenhouse, a greenhouse structure, total outside exposed area of the structure. So here's where you're going to have to go to the internet because you want to find out, number one, the size of your structure. So calculate the volume, and on the internet, you can go and figure out how many BTUs you need. And BTUs are British thermal units that you're going to need for that particular structure. And they also have a nice little tool that says what is the uh, walls, what's the insulative factor of those walls. And you'll find it really quick that glass and some of these plastics have little to none. So you're going to find it really quickly, you know, what heater you will need in order to heat this particular uh, space. Uh, really nice trick and it does work really well. So heating systems could be fueled by gas, electricity, oil, but that's more east coast, generally speaking. Uh, wood, there are some wood furnaces that you can use, and some of them are not in the actual structure itself. Um, you can have some that are outside, which is a good idea. Um, and then the solar and geothermal are possibilities too. Again, a heat pump is ge geothermal. You can make that work. Um, that, that has some, some advantages. Heat distri distributed by hot air, radiant air, uh, heat, hot water, or steam. So you have a, a few options there. You could also look at uh, the possibility of a floor that's heated. And of course, hot air rises. So that works really nice. So heated floors have a possibility. And this again, how deep are your pockets? Cooling. Passive cooling, and that's just air movement through the vents. So you could have roof vents or side vents. And again, that bayless uh, uh, system that opens up the vents is really nice uh, because it does it automatically. There's no electricity needed. So that's really nice. It's all based on the, um, the substance in the gas cartridge, which is usually a wax that liquefies when it's, uh, when it's uh, warm outside and that opens it up. And then as it cools down, it solidifies and it closes. And there's also shading. So you might have to shade the greenhouse, especially a southern exposure in the summertime. So don't forget those shade cloths um, there's different types, uh, different weight, and allows uh, different levels of light through. And they're fairly expensive, and you want to get a full-size piece, so they're expensive, and you, they can cut to order, I'm sure. There's also active cooling. That's usually evaporative cooling systems, so swamp coolers, uh, fans, and pads for cooling the greenhouse. Air circulation and ventilation. Um, air circulation, uh, uh, using the fans to circulate the air. And again, if you look in the upper uh, area of the greenhouse, some of them have fans up there that are just rotating. And those are actually very nice to mix the air. And this is where it's really nice, especially in the wintertime, that even distribution of temperature is so important. And this allows you to push some of the hot air that's, of course, accumulated in the top of the greenhouse down below so you get that mixing. So you won't get those cold spots, which are so important in a greenhouse. You do not want cold spots in a greenhouse. You want it to remain warm throughout, fairly constant temperature throughout that greenhouse. It'll make your plants uh, much uh, more healthy uh, than having them catch cold. Uh, so ventilation, the exchange of inside air for outside air. And again, this is where you have those air intakes that allow air in, and you have a fan usually that's pushing the air out. So the uh, exchange of air between inside and outside. So this can control temperatures, but it also removes moisture. And again, with moisture, you want to think about what's the worst possible case of moisture. Usually speaking, if you have a hose in there and you're just watering with a hose, or you're pushing a lot of water onto the ground, on the floor, uh, that can increase the moisture levels dramatically. And you gotta be really careful of about that. Again, disease is everything with moisture. So pest and disease control, if you build it, plant it, they will come. How do they enter? Usually they fly in, you leave the door open for a little while, it's amazing how many insects can get in. Uh, they blow in a lot of times, uh, brought in 
through plants, soil, or equipment. And that's usually how they're brought in. Usually you bring them in or somebody brings in something that you weren't aware of and they brought in a special guest. So keep that in mind. You want to basically have this as a sanctuary. Um, the best of both worlds are if you ever have a greenhouse, just grow everything from seed. Don't bring anything else in. No plant material comes in other than through seed because in most cases, seed rarely has disease issues. Again, if you buy correct, uh, good quality seeds, uh, certified seed, not a problem. But I realize uh, for some of us, there's certain plants that you know you can't grow from seed easily. Anthuriums are an example. Of course, you're going to buy one. If uh, you're going to put it in your greenhouse, I would recommend quarantine in it for many days to check to make sure you have not brought anything from the nursery you bought it from uh, where you're going to put it into your greenhouse. Uh, that would be one of those that uh, could be a problem. You could use systemics. There are certain systemics that you can use, insecticides that you can water in or granule. And I would do that beforehand before I brought it in the greenhouse to make sure that you basically thoroughly made sure that no insects have been brought into the greenhouse. But trust me, there's nothing worse than trying to control insects in a greenhouse. So prevention is the key. Be clean. Use clean pots. Use a clean potting mix. And again, uh, be careful with potting mix. Some is better than others. Make sure purchased plants are free of pests and disease. So you got to inspect anything that's brought in. Sanitation, clean up all uh, debris. You don't want uh, it, uh, you know, soil on the floor, things like that. You, you clean it up uh, quickly. Move unhealthy looking plants. Nobody gets a second break in this. You have a high criteria. If there's something that's not looking right for that plant, that's where it goes out of the greenhouse, possibly into your house where it's in that quarantine area, and you can look and see if there's a reason why it's looking so unhealthy. Also, no sitting water. We don't want that freestanding water anywhere in a greenhouse. So here's an example of a floor situation where that could be a problem because uh, you've got water that, again, you can splash it onto plants. So if there's disease uh, lurking in that greenhouse, you could have some early blight spores that you actually, as you walk through the greenhouse and through splashing in water, you're actually spreading it to plants throughout the greenhouse. So putting it all together, got to remember that, you know, you, you need warmth in order for that greenhouse to uh, produce plants, especially if you're thinking in the winter. A moisture, you got to think about, um, you know, where is uh, moisture coming in? Um, am I being a little bit overzealous and watering and dumping water on the floor, things like that? And also light uh, is important. How much light, quality of light, and the time of year that you have. So that those are the things that you really need to think about. So let's look at the greenhouse costs now, okay? So we've thought of all the worst case scenarios, right? No, not bloody right yet. So we're gonna start looking at the greenhouse costs. So if you go to Costco and you see that beautiful greenhouse that's calling to you going, oh, buy me, buy me, it's only 1,200 bucks, easy to put together, um, that's the down payment, okay? Um, you've gotta think about a foundation. In Colorado, just parking it on the dirt out into your backyard, you'll find out really quick, especially in the last couple of weeks, with those hurricane force winds, that anything that is not buttoned down is gonna fly away. And there would be nothing worse than a greenhouse made out of glass that's flying across your, uh, your backyard. So a foundation is something you gotta think about. It can be expensive. When you look at bricks and things like that, you can do that, but you still need to anchor it firmly into the ground so that make sure it does not go away. So foundation, usually I'm talking about concrete foundations. Water, before you pour any foundation, figure out how you're gonna get the utilities to the greenhouse. So water, for example, before you dig a three foot uh, deep uh, foundation for your greenhouse and forget to uh, leave room for a water line coming through that concrete, you're gonna be drilling holes through your foundation. That's not a good thing, so plan ahead. So water, electricity, gas, if you're, if you're so fortunate to use gas to heat the greenhouse, it's probably one of the cheaper ways to do it. But uh, again, electrical is coming down in, in cost. So that's something to think about. So 
greenhouse costs. So here's a four-year greenhouse plan. So I was looking at a location, and again, that's a southern facing wall on my garage. But of course, my problem, of course, is my eaves coming off that greenhouse or off the, the, the uh, garage is very steep. And I cannot use that same angle. Otherwise, I would basically have a very short greenhouse. And so I decided to go with a slightly different angle and underpin it under the eaves. And the reason for this is two things. One is think about a greenhouse and think about resell. So in Fort Collins, I had that beautiful greenhouse that was perfect. The people that bought the house from me were so enamored by that greenhouse. That helped sell the, the house. But within a year, they really didn't have the passion for a greenhouse. And really quickly, you find out that, you know, you, you don't go out there every day. You don't check on the plants. And before long, you have a lot of dead plants. And after a while, you get uh, kind of frustrated. Again, if you don't have a passion for a greenhouse, my thought is I would be very careful about putting one in. The other is not everybody wants a greenhouse. And of course, when I revisited the house five years later that I sold, it had a beautiful greenhouse. It was gone. They didn't want it. So somebody bought the house and took it, tore it out. And so the same is true with your greenhouse. Um, the way I designed mine, if I decided to remove the greenhouse, I have no way have altered the structure of my garage. So that allows me to basically separate the greenhouse from the garage if I needed to. So that's just a thought. Uh, trench digging, uh, digging, what occurred in November 2013. Mind you, four-year plan of greenhouse. I'm a... Uh, I'm a yard sailor, dumpster diver, alley, hound, whatever you want to call it. So I got a lot of my materials by just scrounging over four years. And uh, again, um, it's still, there's still costs involved even in scrounging. But so this was what we were doing. We were digging our greenhouse uh, foundation. Again, I put it to code. It's at three feet. Um, you find out really quickly, you're going to find treasures if you never – if the house is old, like mine's over 100 years old, uh, there were many uh, archaeological finds in the soil out in my trench digging uh, foundation system. Now, the foundation, we decided, of course, to use concrete. So you got to have a, a, either a truck come out and deliver it, or uh, you mix it yourself with a, uh, with a uh, cement mixer. And in our case, we decided to do that. So we had a whole group of us. I had my kids there helping me putting in the foundation. Again, remember that concrete is really a liquid. So make sure that your, your uh, forms are set to place so they don't uh, flex because concrete is very heavy and it goes to where there's an opening. Got to have a junkyard dog. So here we poured the foundation actually in December. And here in January, uh, we're letting it cure. Got the rebar in there, you can see that. And it's always good to have a junkyard dog that uh, allows you to have your tools and things laying out and, and nobody bothers them. So that was the happiest my dog ever was, sitting on that pile of soil. Uh, I hope you're able to look over the fence to see what else was out there. Brick lane. Um, this is gonna require a little patience. Anybody can do it, but you're gonna find out really quick there's art and science to any kind of, 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 uh, of uh, labor like this. Um, it truly is uh, amazing to watch bricklayers, how quick they are and how accurate they are, and that takes time. And so your first layer of brick, if you've never laid brick before, uh, there's, uh, it's good to have music in the background because there could be some cursing that occurs, especially when the, the mortar is too wet or too dry and you're not getting proper adhesion. You're going to find it really quick that it looked easy, but it actually uh, is hard to get it correct. And by the way, it's got to be straight. Every brick's got to be straight because every brick that you lay, the next layer is dependent on it. So if it's crooked or sagging, it's hard to to take up that, uh, that uh, issue. You can do it. Um, the pros do it. They know how to do it. But you're going to learn. It's kind of a learning on the job, so to speak. But uh, get yourself some good levels, very important string levels, the whole nine yards to lay your brick. Uh, again, one thing about brick, again, when I uh, dumpster dive for brick, I found out really quick 
bricks are not standard sized. There's all different sizes. And you may think that those bricks that you have bought on Craigslist, 100 of them here, 100 of them there, you'll find it really quick that the size could be a quarter inch, eighth inch, or even a, uh, a quarter or eighth inch is the worst um, because you don't notice it as much. But if they're a little larger, you can notice that. But even three eighths to a half inch, you will find out really quick. If you mix those bricks together, it will drive you nuts. And by the way, you need to have a good brick saw because uh, if that's the issue, you can cut bricks to, to size, but it takes a long time and you need to have a good brick uh, cutter to do it. Utilities, don't forget about utilities. So if you have established landscape, that's gonna be a problem because when you're ditch witching, and in this case, I couldn't use a ditch witch because going three feet down to get those lines in, um, I couldn't get a machine big enough into my backyard to do it. So I was all hand dug with that post hole digger there and a sharpshooter shovel. Um, took a long time, but that I call that therapy, right? And you can see the foundation uh, where, I, where I'm running my lines to again from the house out to the, to the garage. Uh, heating and uh, heat and floor installation. So this is where you can look at that uh, kind of that uh, hydronic uh, floor system. Um, one thing about it is it can be expensive and they're, 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 they're somewhat difficult to put together at times. It just depends, but you got to have a level. And again, you can see what I'm doing, putting sand down, putting layers of bricks that allow holes to run the PEX pipe through. And so here you see the PEX pipe going in. But one thing I thought about is that brick that has those openings is very sharp and rough. And this PEX pipe, as it heats and cools, moves about two inches per 16 feet. So I calculated out that and found out that it's gonna rub on the brick. And so I had to put a extra piece of plastic to actually uh, pipe, a uh, sleeve in other words, to compensate for it so it would not wear out my PEX pipe because that PEX pipe is one continuous piece of pipe. You don't wanna puncture that because uh, that could be a really hard or difficult to fix. So you only want to do this one time, right? So uh, this, this took three people to feed that pipe through. Again, it's continuous. So you keep interlacing it back and forth, back and forth. And so it was quite a process. So again, floor insulation, and then I put a, a nice layer of brick on top of those uh, brick that were uh, had the whole systems for the pecs to go through. So it looked really pretty. Actually, it's pre prettier than my uh, kitchen floor, actually. And so uh, my wife was amazed at how pretty it looked. Uh, now it's time to uh, put some wood onto the, uh, the brick. Uh, in this case, uh, again, it's a wet environment. Um, I use stainless steel plates, uh, very expensive. Uh, if you have to ask how much you can't afford them, they're very expensive. But uh, the reason why I did that is because I didn't want rust. Any kind of steel, generally speaking, is going to rust over time. And I didn't like that rust blend, uh, bleeding down and staining the bricks or the wood. So for that reason, I went with stainless steel. Wall construction, again, I'm using redwood. Redwood was expensive then, it's even more expensive now. I also treated the redwood afterwards. I decided to use a, a, a type of stain uh, in order to uh, enhance the properties of the color of the redwood, but also uh, for protection. You only want to do this once, generally speaking. You don't have to redo it. So a couple of coats, I made sure that uh, it was well covered. And then we got to start looking at the roof construction. In the roof construction, this is where I dumpster dived. I found pieces of glass from old solar panels. Again, they did, uh, in a sense, impact a little bit of light transfusion. It's not perfectly clear glass. It's darn close, but it's tempered glass. And why I use tempered glass, of course, is because of hail. You don't want glass to shatter if it's not tempered. Because if somebody was in there when a hailstorm occurred, you probably with regular glass, that could be life-threatening. With tempered glass, also life-threatening, but not quite as dangerous because it tends to cube up when it breaks. So there's a little safety factor there. Plus it's stronger. So you can see how 
Uh, one thing about tempered glass, because it was a certain size, it was two feet by four feet. Unfortunately, I needed six feet. So what did I have to do? I actually had to uh, slide the glass on top of itself to extend a six foot length. Um, I could not cut, you can't cut tempered glass. So it's starting to take shape and you can see uh, a window insert. And again, all my inserts, everything about this, I can take it all apart because it's all modulized how I created it. So everything, it can be disassembled other than the jackhammer will have to come in to take out that foundation, but uh, everything else can be easily removed. There's the uh, rough and uh, window panels uh, going in. And uh, again, it's starting to take really nice shape and uh, the grass, I planted the grass, uh, you know, a little early, but that's okay. It worked out really well. Um, but that particular grass in front of the greenhouse right there is called Bella. It's a blue grass that you can only buy uh, through turf. You can't buy seed of it. And it definitely uh, doesn't require as much mowing as regular uh, blue grass. It was, um, I believe, uh, released through the University of Nebraska. It's called Bella is the name of the blue grass. Very interesting grass. Um, Rough panels in place, and you can see those where I had to double the glass because of the length, and I've got channels in there. Everything's looking really good. Uh, window panels coming in, and again, I just slid those into place, and then uh, tacked them in with, uh, with quarter round, and so that worked out really well. So each one is modulized to, to work. Just remember, if you're dumpster diving or trying to design a greenhouse, the greenhouse design depends on the size of your window. Don't forget that. You can't mix and match windows. If they're different sizes, it screws up your framing. And I found that out really quick when I was trying to repurpose as much windows as possible. I was collecting them all over and I found out that I could get five windows, but I might need six. And if I can't find that sixth window, trying to make an old ancient window is really expensive. You'll find out really quick trying to have somebody make that for you would be outrageously expensive. But if you've got the woodworking equipment and somebody who knows how to do it, you can make your own windows. It, it can be done uh, a lot cheaper than having uh, Pella do it. I will guarantee you it will be the most expensive greenhouse ever on earth if you ever had to go through Pella windows. That's just my thought. Um, side window panel placement. This is where I did dumpster dive those windows and I did not have enough for a complete set, unfortunately. That's originally was my intent to use this window here throughout my greenhouse, but I could never get enough of those. And trying to build a window, especially with that vertical line with those five window panes was outrageously expensive. So you also got to think about electrical. Uh, so electricity is important, and if it's dangerous, you know, always get your son to help you uh, with that. Um, again, you want to make sure it's a wet uh, environment, so everything's going to have conduit associated with it. Ground fault interrupts is what you want because water and electricity are not friends. Okay. Ventilation. Here's where it's uh, important. And I'll, uh, by the way, so you see that oscillating fan, that was a $30 oscillating fan that I can anchor onto the wall. I use plywood in that and it rotates and it gives me very good uh, distribution of air throughout that greenhouse so I don't have cold spots. So in the winter time, I'll run that so many hours a day to mix that air. But uh, generally speaking, my greenhouse is very uh, well designed so that I don't have those cold spots. Plus the type of heat is important. Again, if you've got floor heat, it works pretty well. So my heating system initially, I ran it through the floor. I found it really quick though that I made a mistake. Um, you need insulation under your uh, brick. Now here's my problem. Putting any kind of uh, insulative uh, um, fabric or material under that worried me because I was worried about water, that in a greenhouse is your water and you're gonna have water go through. And of course it's gonna go through the floor and sit um, in that insulated area. And that's what bothered me because I was worried, so worried about uh, you know, water that sits and sits uh, is a basically a invitation for disease but also uh, diseases for us. So you gotta think about Legionnaire's disease. Mm -hmm. So you gotta think about ventilation 
is very important. And not having water basically percolate through the soil out of your way is not a problem if you've had that. But when you put a layer, impermeable layer, under your brick uh, to try to capture heat, that's a problem. So for that reason, my uh, temperature in the greenhouse could never, it wouldn't drop below 45 degrees, but I had a hard time bumping it up at the night. I couldn't get it up above a certain temperature that I really wanted, especially on a, you know, for example of a zero degree day uh, where it's really cold outside and I'm trying to keep my tomatoes alive or producing really. Alive is not a problem. You know, lettuce, if you're growing lettuce, 45 degree low temperature is perfect. You'll, you'll never have a problem with lettuce or spinach or anything like that. But tomatoes, yes. Tropical plants, yes, you'll have problems. But I'm using a hot water heater again. That was a dumpster dive. That was actually a Craigslist purchase. So I'm actually using a hot water heater as a boiler. I've got my compression tank. You can see it there. And I've got my taco uh, circulation pump, which uh, it runs on very little electricity and it pumps the hot water into the floor, then back out into the hot water heater, which then heats it. Very inefficient. When you think about it, it's hot water. I'm using electricity. It's not a gas hot water heater, but uh, it did work and it still works to this day. And that's, we're pushing five years actually. So I decided to bring my heating system above ground. So rather than even though I have my floor all installed, if I wanted to really use that, um, the floor heating system, I could get a boiler, actually buy a boiler to increase the temperature hotter than what my hot water heater does. But instead, I dumpster dived and found this radiator on Craigslist. And the guy gave it to me because he loved the idea that what I was going to do with it, um, that I wasn't going to just scrap it. And so I put it in the greenhouse and this worked like a charm because that radiator heat is so uniform that it keeps my greenhouse warm in all parts of the greenhouse. So when I walk in the door and it's 10 degrees outside, um, when I walk in, it's immediately warm and you don't feel cold draft coming through that door. So I love uh, radiator heat, works really well. And there you go, I put the covering on it. I've got my plants in there. And again, uh, some of the plants come in in the wintertime, the Christmas cactus, again, I make sure there's no pests on those. I also had some uh, um, fuchsia that I really loved, but, uh, that has since uh, moved on, uh, but I did bring some plants in, but again, I had quarantined them before they come into the greenhouse. Greenhouse complete, well, yes, kinda. Um, there's always modifications you can do. Again, gotta think, think about the snow load. So there we got about 12 inches of snow on the greenhouse, not a problem. Um, uh, it's engineered, over-engineered. I basically use laminate uh, beams I created out of two by fours, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, out of two by sixes um, where I laminated uh, one bys in between, so glued them together. So that's a stronger load than buying, for example, a four by four or a six by four uh, beam. So when you're looking at the weight of what you're gonna carry, and again, glass is what I have there. So that's one of the heavier uh, roof materials uh, versus uh, film plastic, which wouldn't require near as uh, a heavy uh, system. Okay. So I got to ask you a question. How much did it cost in materials alone to build my greenhouse? And again, that's factoring in um, um, the uh, dumpster diving that I did. So I actually saved a lot of money, but my total output after everything, of course, nobody throws out a redwood and that was super expensive. It was about 5,200 bucks. And that's even after I got really dirt cheap prices on bricks and things. So. The greenhouse was way more expensive than I thought it would be because I thought I was accumulating and scavenging plenty of material. But you, when you start thinking about it, when you have to go look for Romex wire and stuff like that, you can sometimes find that on Craigslist. But things add up, little things, junction boxes, uh, electrical uh, circuit panels, things like that. It really adds up. And of course, the PEX pipe, that was super expensive. And uh, the different pumps and stuff, expensive. It adds up really quick. So after I've told you the good, the bad, and the ugly, will you be buying or building a greenhouse after attending this class? So if you could put in that poll there just to let me know what your thoughts are at the moment.
I like that. That's split. That's uh, and there you go. So we have one who I would say has the passion, uh, realizes the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, about greenhouses. Um, you, you'll find out really quick that uh, it's actually a, a great place for uh, mental therapy. I really do like uh, the fact that I could go out there and think about nothing. It's my escape time. So if you use it for that, then again, the cost is priceless, right? So that's, that's something to think about. Anyway, so with that, I want to ask if there's any questions, and I'd like to go ahead and uh, um, allow you to open up the unmute yourself if you could. Cassie, if you go ahead and unmute the group. Anyway, if you want to talk about us. Uh, we did have one question in the chat from Tony. Um, okay. He wants to know if with hoop houses with roll up sides, if the sides are up to help circulation, pests can come in. How do you control pests? Uh, and that's with a hoop house? Yes. Um, that would be tough. That would be really tough. Could you put screen in below? It's possible. But the size of screen is really important. And there's certain insects like thrips uh, that can get through, and spider mites can get through a lot of your mesh. Again, your regular with, oh, uh, screen. Uh, it's really tough to keep those pests out. Um, what I recommend, and again, my greenhouse, I actually have a swamp cooler that has those pads. And that really helps keep the pests out. Because what I'm doing is pulling air through that water wall, so to speak, that, uh, that fiber wall of, of wet. And that helps keep some of the insects from coming into the greenhouse. So that's one way to do it. But a hoop house, that's really tough. I know that that's going to be, and the other is in a hoop house, a lot of times, if you're planting directly into the, the dirt of the, of the uh, greenhouse, of the uh, hoop house, that in itself is going to make it almost impossible to keep pest free. Did that answer the question? And you can talk directly to me. Yeah, I, I, this was my first time putting together a hoop house. And I okay. mean, that was like one of the first things I noticed. Uh, was when I have it open to allow the heat to, you know, get out, some cool air to come in, uh, that towards the nighttime, that's when then I'm seeing all kinds of different bugs at the top of the um, of the house. And yep. I was just wondering if there's any way to kind of keep that down. Um, it, it basically, it has four raised beds inside of it. Okay. And uh, uh, right now, I have it pretty much just open all the time to keep the heat, uh, you know, it not getting too hot in there. Right. Yeah. It's possible you could use maybe row covers over your beds is a okay. possibility to kind of help. Uh, aphids are definitely going to be a problem in a hoop house, uh, especially if you're growing greens and things like that. I've noticed that in a lot of hoop houses, uh, some of the brassica aphids, oh my goodness. So the, you know, cabbage aphids and that, they are tough. And of course, you're growing them to eat usually don't want to use a whole lot of pesticides. And so uh, the best way is if you can kind of keep them contained by screening them out rather than spraying them. There are some biological uh, products that you can use, some insects, and uh, there's certain fungi that you can use actually that are biological agents to control insects. So those have potential. And there's also neem oils, which are organic, but again, it's still, it comes from a tree. Um, they're somewhat effective. It depends on the insect, but generally, uh, you want to just keep them out. You know, in a hoop house, it's hard to do. You might have to go to that next level and look at the rigid side uh, kind of greenhouse if you have the passion over time. But I like your thought process, especially starting out with a hoop house, which is cheaper, to find out if that's the way you want to go. I consider that almost like a progression toward a greenhouse. So a hoop house is not a bad way to start. It's kind of your first rodeo. And after you get good at it, you find out that, oh, I, you know, I want to do it year round because a hoop house is hard to do year round. You can do it with frost proof uh, faucets and things like that. But in a greenhouse too, you got to think about the water. Um, carrying the water from your house to a greenhouse gets old really quick. Water is really heavy. So 
I would recommend if you're going to put in a greenhouse, put in a water system, put a sink in there. A utility sink is perfect. I love my utility sink because I can clean my pots. I can do everything right there in the greenhouse. I don't need to do it outside. And in the winter, it's usually one of those times when you have kind of that spring cleaning thought and you're cleaning a lot of things. Um, it also is great to have a sink that you can also use it for other things uh, is great. So, yep. Other questions? So if I mind asking, who is the one that uh, decided to build a greenhouse? Who is uh, the uh, participant that uh, uh, said they'd, they'd go for it? If you want to identify yourself. Again, you have to unmute yourself if you would, if you want to answer. Nobody's coming down. Okay. All right. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? We have a few minutes left. Well, this is a little bit off the wall, Dad, and it's not related to greenhouses at all, but <laughs> uh, we got to, as a group, uh, Master Gardeners, we got to come to your house last year and do that nice Surrey ride. Through your yes. Neighbor. And we came across.